Longevity by definition is having a long life and staying alive. However, most people can't achieve their longevity potential because they die to different chronic diseases like heart disease or cancer in their 60s and 70s. The centenarians who live to 100 get the same diseases as everyone else, but they get them 10 to 20 years later. So living longer mostly comes down to avoiding the chronic diseases that would kill you prematurely. I call this the longevity leap. Over the past 10 years, I've been working on my longevity in a preventive way to make sure that I don't die prematurely like my grandfather who passed away to colorectal cancer at the age of 36. That's why in this video I'm going to outline my full evidence-based longevity routine. You will also hear commentary from two professors and researchers of aging, Dr. Matt Caberlane and Dr. Michael Lustgarden. There's really no question that aging and longevity are modifiable in humans. And I think we can we can see that most obviously through uh, what we know about lifestyle and the effect on age-related disease and, and health span. If we know the biochemistry of youth and then see which interventions, diet, exercise, body weight, calorie intake, et cetera, can keep our biomarkers youthful, how much extra life expectancy can we get? You can check out all the studies and references in the blog post that are left in the description below. This is the short version of my routine. If you want me to release the longer, more in-depth version of this routine, then make sure you click a like, subscribe, and watch until the end. Let's begin with one of the main goals of a healthy diet, which is maintaining optimal body composition. We know that things like obesity and diabetes can accelerate the age-related risk for a whole bunch of functional declines and diseases and shorten lifespan. An obese person has about five to 20 years shorter life expectancy. So to make the longevity leap and not die prematurely, you have to make sure that you're not overweight and obese. One accurate way to assess your metabolic health and disease risk is to look at your waist to hip ratio. People with more weight around the midsection are at a higher risk of heart disease, diabetes and premature death than those who carry it around the hips and thighs. You calculate your waist to hip ratio by taking your waist circumference and dividing it by your hip circumference. The lowest risk of heart disease is seen with a waist to hip ratio below 0.95 for men and 0.80 for women with a waist to hip ratio above 1.0 for men and 0.86 for women, you would see the highest risk. My waist circumference is quite low, only 80 centimeters, and my waist to hip ratio is less than 0.83. That puts me in the lowest risk category possible. Next, let's cover the most researched method of extending lifespan in animals, its calorie restriction. A reduction in caloric intake, in particular in mice and rats, of you know starting around 20% all the way up to about 60% reduction, and I'm just talking calories across the board, can lead to an increase in lifespan and apparently an improvement in health span. And what I mean by that is the animals seem to be protected against a whole host of age-related diseases and functional declines. Calorie restriction extending human lifespan is obviously very limited because it's very hard to do long-term calorie restriction studies. The real answer is we don't know at this point whether caloric restriction slows aging, increases lifespan and health span on average in people. We do have a few randomized clinical trials on humans finding that calorie restriction improves multiple cardiometabolic risk factors even in young, non-obese adults. I think that based on the current evidence, you don't need to adhere to a specific calorie restricted diet to live longer. You just have to make sure that you don't become overweight and obese. And being in a calorie deficit is obviously crucial and important to weight loss and maintaining a good body composition. My own calorie intake falls somewhere between 2000 to 2500 calories per day. This is what keeps my body fat percentage around 10% year round while still being able to build muscle and strength. One of the proposed methods of gaining the benefits of calorie restriction without actually having to do it is intermittent fasting, also called time-restricted eating. Research about time-restricted eating has found that it can improve markers of metabolic health, such as blood sugar levels, triglycerides, waist circumference, and cholesterol in obese as well as non-obese individuals. However, multiple randomized clinical trials from 2022 and 2023 have shown that intermittent fasting isn't superior to regular calorie restriction. For some people, intermittent fasting and time-restricted feeding can be very powerful tools to help them maintain an overall positive body composition and, and healthy body weight. For other people, it doesn't really work. But there is evidence that eating most of your calories earlier in the day is better than eating them later in the day. At least restricting your caloric intake 
you know, very close to bedtime for a lot of people makes sense because it improves sleep quality and probably improves glucose regulation overnight. I've been doing intermittent fasting for the last 10 years and it has worked very well for me in terms of maintaining optimal body composition and healthy biomarkers. I make sure that I stop eating at least four to five hours before bed. Now let's move on with one of the most talked about aspects of longevity, which are the foods. All diets that appear to be good for health have one thing in common. They minimize the consumption of ultra-processed food intake. Ultra-processed food intake is associated with increased risk of cardiovascular events and all-cause mortality in a linear fashion. It also increases the risk of dementia and Alzheimer's disease, even after controlling for calorie intake. Based on the data, you could get away with one to two servings of ultra-processed food per day. But more than that is associated with increased risk of adverse health outcomes. If I were to describe my own diet, then I would say it's more like a very Mediterranean-style diet with a little bit more protein and carbohydrates. There have been many studies showing that greater adherence to a Mediterranean diet reduces cardiovascular disease, cancer, and premature mortality. What are some of the main components of the Mediterranean diet? It's polyphenols. A 2023 study from Spain found that a higher intake of polyphenols was associated with a 20% lower risk of all-cause mortality. Dozens of other cohort studies in different countries have found similar results. I have heart disease and cancer in my family, which is why I incorporate plenty of polyphenols into my diet, such as olive oil, coffee, different kinds of vegetables, nuts and seeds. Another food group that reduces my risk of colorectal cancer and heart disease is fiber. People with a higher dietary fiber intake have been seen to have the lowest risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and colorectal cancer mortality. That's why for my specific genetic risk, getting plenty of fiber is very important. The recommended daily allowance for total fiber intake for men is 38 grams a day and for women 25 grams a day. I personally get around 30 to 40 grams of fiber a day from various sources. A 2021 meta-analysis saw that a higher fruit and vegetable intake was linked to a lower risk of all-cause mortality, with the benefits plateauing at five servings of fruit and vegetables per day. I'm getting at least three to four servings of vegetable per day, and one to two servings of fruit per day, usually in the form of an apple, a banana, and some berries. Fiber intake is probably the most underrated nutrient when it comes to health and potentially longevity. Up to 50 grams a day being associated with higher levels of lean mass, higher grip strength. Another important yet controversial topic about longevity is protein intake. There is evidence in animals that a high protein intake shortens lifespan. When it comes to humans, then a low protein intake is actually associated with increased risk of mortality in the elderly specifically. We know in older people that loss of lean mass, loss of muscle mass, loss of bone density contributes to frailty, and that can be a major risk factor both for negative quality of life and also for mortality. The recommended daily allowance of protein is currently at 0.36 grams per pound per day or 0.8 grams per kilogram per day. However, many experts consider this to be inadequate, especially for the elderly. For muscle and strength gain, the optimal amount of protein appears to be between 0.8 to 1.0 grams per pound, or 1.6 to 2.2 grams per kilogram of lean body mass. That's why I get about 0.8 grams per pound of protein per day. I weigh around 80 kilograms, so on most days, I try to stick between 130 to 150 grams. My protein sources include fish, eggs, dairy, beans, some meat, and a plant-based protein that I co-founded called Crump that's made of only hemp flour and pea protein. Now let's talk about carbohydrates because this is also very controversial. In epidemiology, many studies find a U-shaped association between carbohydrate intake and all-cause mortality. With increased mortality below 40% and above 55% of calories from carbohydrates. The obvious problem is that most of these studies are epidemiology, and we can't derive causal relationship from that. Diet quality matters as well, as it's been found that both unhealthy low-fat and unhealthy low-carb diets increase mortality, whereas healthy low-carb and low-fat diets don't. A higher fiber to carbohydrate ratio has also been seen to be associated with up to 20% lower risk of mortality. Eating more refined grains and refined sugars is linked to increased chronic disease and mortality. Thus, it's better to get more of the carbohydrates from fibrous vegetables instead of refined carbohydrates. My main carbohydrate sources besides vegetables and fruit are potatoes, but I also eat whole grains. I don't have any problems with my blood work, and I believe that you should adjust your carbohydrate intake based on your blood work. All right, so for glucose, the, uh, what's optimal is in the 80 to 94 range. Above 94, increase all-cause mortality risk. 
below 80, increased all-cause mortality risk. In youth, average blood glucose levels in a very large epidemiological study was about 85 milligrams per deciliter. So towards the lower end of that range, 80 to 85, probably optimal when it comes to glucose levels. For HbA1c, values around 5 to 5.3% 5 are found in youth. And in terms of all-cause mortality risk, uh, values in the 5 to 6% range are associated with lowest all-cause mortality risk. Now let's move on with fats because they do have a very important role in longevity. Many meta-analyses involving over 1 million people suggest that saturated fat intake is associated with increased mortality and polyunsaturated fat intake is linked to decreased risk. A 2020 large Cochrane meta-analysis found that the effect of saturated fat on cardiovascular disease follows an S-shaped association. Based on the results, risk of cardiovascular disease events and mortality starts to increase after 8% of total energy intake from saturated fat, and the risk stays relatively the same from 9 to 13%. A 2020 UK biobank study found that all-cause mortality started to increase after 10% of total calories coming from saturated fat. So it appears that getting less than 10% of your total calories from saturated fat is what's optimal for lowering the risk of cardiovascular disease and mortality specifically. In terms of all-cause mortality risk, we can see that lowest risk in this study was somewhere around 220 to 230 milligrams per deciliter. And then above that, risk started to, all-cause mortality risk started to increase for both men and women. But then also, uh, lower levels too were associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. Now, an important point to highlight here is that reverse causation may be involved in this increased risk at the lower total cholesterol levels. So to account for that, but a recently published study uh, adjusted for more comorbidities that can impact these data, including lung disease, liver disease, kidney disease, which are commonly omitted as adjustments in these studies. For example, this study here was not adjusted for lung, liver, or kidney disease, uh, and this, basically what happens is this increased association at the lower total cholesterol levels goes away with only higher levels, relatively higher levels. I believe it was above 200 milligrams per deciliter being associated with an increased risk. What's more, it's been found that replacing saturated fat with polyunsaturated fat and monounsaturated fat is seen to be linked to reduced risk of heart disease. That's why most of my fat comes from olive oil and fish. There is a strong link between fish consumption and reduced risk of cardiovascular disease and neurodegeneration. People with the highest blood levels of EPA and DHA have been seen to have a lower risk of death from heart disease and Alzheimer's. That's why I take an omega-3 supplement every day and I eat fish around three times per week. Now let's cover what I believe is the most powerful thing for your longevity. It's physical exercise. Let's start with cardiorespiratory fitness because it's inversely associated with mortality. Compared to those with the lowest cardiorespiratory fitness, those with the highest cardiorespiratory fitness have been seen to have a fourfold lower risk of mortality. Smoking typically increases your mortality risk by two to three times, which means that being unfit is pretty much as bad as smoking. The lowest risk of mortality has been observed at a VO2 max of 50 milliliters per kilogram per minute. You can increase your VO2 max with regular slow steady state cardio, also called zone 2 training, or with high intensity interval training. The best way is obviously to do both. I usually do one high intensity interval workout per week and two to three zone 2 workouts per week. That's because the research suggests that moderate intensity exercise is associated with greater reductions in all-cause mortality risk. A 2023 systematic review found that the more moderate physical activity you do, the lower your all-cause mortality risk, whereas the benefits of vigorous exercise plateaued at 200 minutes per week. So my goal is to get around 200 minutes of vigorous exercise per week and up to 800 minutes of moderate physical exercise per week. Next, let's cover muscle and strength. There's a lot of evidence suggesting that muscle mass and strength are inversely associated with all-cause mortality. But when we compare muscle mass and muscle strength, then a 2014 study found that those with low muscle mass alone saw a 23% increased risk of mortality. However, the individuals with low muscle strength alone were at a 98% higher risk irrespective of their muscle mass. Thus, having low muscle strength was linked up to a four times greater risk of mortality than having low muscle mass alone. Obviously, both are important. You want to have plenty of muscle tissue and you want to have plenty of muscle strength as well. But if you compare head to head, then muscle strength appears to be a lot more important. The best way to build muscle and strength is to do resistance training. You can do calisthenics, powerlifting, bodybuilding, crossfit, etc. 
The main tenet and requirement is progressive overload, which basically describes getting stronger over time. I've been doing resistance training for the last 10 years, and I believe that it is one of the most powerful things you can do for your health. However, several 2022 meta-analyses have found that the benefits of resistance training on mortality, heart disease and cancer plateau after 60 minutes per week. Doing more than 140 minutes per week is actually associated with an increased risk of mortality. What's the reason for this is unknown. It's thought that it might have to do with the increased arterial stiffness and inflammation from chronic overtraining. But whether or not it's true is still to be confirmed by future randomized clinical trials. There is published data showing that there may be an optimal dose where if you go above that, now the gains, the life expectancy gains or the all-cause mortality risk reduction, it, start to, it starts to go away. So finding that bottom of the U shape in terms of minimizing risk from exercise training without going above that is a part of the approach. Based on the evidence, if you're already doing resistance training three times per week, then you won't really gain extra benefits by doing more than that. It might actually provide diminishing returns. And at that point, you're much better off doing a more moderate exercise like zone 2 cardio because there doesn't appear to be any plateau for the health benefits of moderate physical exercise. The more moderate physical exercise you do, the lower your risk of heart disease and mortality. The final component of exercise that I'm going to cover is walking. Higher daily step count is linearly associated with lower all-cause mortality and cardiovascular disease. A 2020 JAMA study found that walking 12,000 steps per day was associated with a 65% lower risk of mortality compared to taking only 4,000 steps per day. There were no observed benefits going beyond 12,000 steps a day. I personally try to get at least 8,000 to 12,000 steps per day. This is probably the most asked about topic of this video, which is supplementation. For the sake of this video, I'm going to mention only a few of these supplements that have evidence suggesting that they are beneficial for longevity. You can check out my other video about all the supplements that I take. The first supplement that I'm going to start with is probably the most evidence-based over-the-counter longevity supplement there is. It's called Glynac or Glycine and NAC. There are multiple human clinical trials showing that Glynac supplementation improves hallmarks of aging and reverses functional declines in body composition, muscle strength, walking speed, cognition, and insulin resistance. Now, these studies are usually done in the elderly, and I believe that for the elderly, Glynac supplementation is one of the best ones. Whether or not Glynac is going to work in younger individuals, we don't know. That's why I'm not taking Glynac every day, but I will certainly do it after the age of 40. I'm not taking NAC every day, but I do take large amounts of glycine every day. The biggest reason besides boosting glutathione is collagen. Collagen is one-third glycine. There are many human trials showing that collagen peptides improve skin health and reverse signs of skin aging. Your skin collagen content starts decreasing in your 20s already at a rate of about 10% per decade. By the age of 70, you could have lost up to 50% of your skin collagen content. For optimal collagen turnover, it's been found that you need at least 12 grams of glycine per day, but it could be even higher. Here's what I do to get at least 12 grams of glycine per day. Number one, I take a collagen peptide supplement. If you take 10 grams of collagen peptides, then you're going to get 3 grams of glycine from that. The brand of collagen I'm using, Nordcode, actually has an extra 5 grams of added glycine. So I'm getting 8 grams of glycine per scoop of their complete collagen. You can try out the Nordcode collagen at livehealthy.com forward slash Nordcode with two O's and use the code SEAM10 for 10% discount. Number two, I also eat glycine-rich foods. Fish with the skin, chicken with the skin, gelatin, etc. From dietary sources, I might be getting two to three grams of glycine. And number three, I take some glycine powder, mostly by adding it to my tea or coffee or yogurt or something like that. Because it tastes sweet, it can also help with sleep and it helps to lower blood sugar levels. In total, I'll be getting around 15 grams of glycine per day. There are also some popular pharmaceuticals that claim to have longevity benefits. Metformin is a potent anti-diabetic drug that reduces the risk of mortality in diabetics. And in diabetics taking metformin, there is evidence that they're protected against other age-related diseases. Maybe not all, but at least a subset. There's not much evidence at this point, and there's been some controversy about whether diabetics taking metformin have reduced risk of disease or improved uh, mortality compared to non-diabetics. I think the consensus at this point is probably not. That that it, it is not the case that a diabetic on metformin is going to do better than a non-diabetic not taking metformin. So then the real question is, what happens in non-diabetics taking metformin? And we, have, we don't know. 
So if you have diabetes, then metformin can be life-saving, and it certainly reduces your risk of mortality. But many longevity enthusiasts are also taking metformin off-label. Is it worth it? In 2014, there was a study that suggested that diabetics taking metformin could live 15% longer than non-diabetics not taking metformin. However, the problem is that this was an observational study and they didn't control for other variables. A recent 2022 reassessment of that 2014 study found that in case control pairs, using metformin was found to be associated with increased mortality no matter the dose. The danger of taking metformin recreationally if you don't have diabetes is that it can reduce your VO2 max, it could reduce your muscle mass, and it can also reduce your testosterone levels. As we've already covered, these things are incredibly important for longevity. We know metformin is a mitochondrial toxin, so it may impact the positive benefits of exercise. So my view is there's not a lot of reason for non-diabetics to, to think about taking metformin if, if all of your other biomarkers look good in terms of metabolic state. The next longevity drug people like to use is rapamycin. Rapamycin is a pharmaceutical that's most used in kidney transplant patients to prevent organ rejection. Rapamycin also inhibits a major growth pathway in the body called mTOR, which is why many longevity enthusiasts are taking it for longevity. Rapamycin has been seen to extend lifespan in animals by up to 60%. So based on the current evidence, there is no reason for me to take rapamycin or metformin. I don't have any diabetes, I don't have any other health problems. And in fact, metformin and rapamycin could actually have some potential negative side effects on my fitness. Matt also launched a community initiative with his lab and a company called Aura Biomedical to test different longevity compounds. Where people can actually sponsor their interventions. They can pick the molecules that they want to have tested and Aura will test them and put them in an open access uh, database for the community. So uh, if people want to check that out, go to aurabiomedical.com and there will be a, a sponsor and intervention uh, link on that website. Let's move on with one of the most overlooked aspects of longevity, which is sleep. The recommended amount of sleep is seven to nine hours for adults. A 2010 systematic review saw that the risk of death was 12% higher for people who slept 6 hours or less. So sleeping less than 6 hours is definitely not a healthy thing and it will shorten your lifespan. On most nights I sleep around 7 to 8 hours, but sometimes I sleep up to 9 hours if I need to recover from exercise. Here are the main things I do for my sleep. Number 1. I maintain a consistent bedtime and wake-up time. This has been shown to improve sleep onset, improve overall sleep quality and recovery. I usually go to bed at 9.30 p.m. and I'm asleep by 10 p.m. In the morning I wake up around 6 to 7 a.m. Number two, avoid bright lights at night. Artificial blue light suppresses melatonin, the main sleep hormone. Melatonin is not only important for sleep, but also for antioxidant offense, anti-aging and managing inflammation. To minimize the bright light exposure in the evening, I wear blue blocking glasses about one hour before bed. The brand of blue blockers I use filter out the specific wavelengths of light that inhibit melatonin. You can check them out at bondcharge.com forward slash seamlund and use the code seam for 15% discount. And number three, sleep in a cooler room. Sleeping at high temperatures decreases REM and deep sleep. However, both high as well as too low temperature can be harmful for sleep efficiency. At the end of the day, you have to find out what works best for you in terms of the sleep temperature. Another cornerstone part of my longevity routine is using the sauna regularly. Taking the sauna over four times a week compared to two to three times per week is associated with 63% lower risk of sudden cardiac death, 63% reduced heart disease mortality, 50% lower fatal cardiovascular disease, 48% lower fatal coronary heart disease, 46% lower risk of hypertension, and 40% reduced all-cause mortality. Sauna bathing is also associated with reduced dementia and neurodegeneration. Those using the sauna four to seven times a week have a 66% lower risk of dementia and 65% lower risk of Alzheimer's disease compared to taking the sauna once a week. So as you can see, the sauna can be very powerful in preventing many of the chronic diseases. I think it's certainly number two after exercise in terms of the magnitude of effect. Based on the research, then the optimal dose of taking the sauna is 15 to 20 minute sessions up to four times per week. You could do more than that, but it's not going to give you additional health benefits. But doing the sauna four times a week is certainly better than doing it once or twice a week. The optimal temperature appears to be around 70 degrees Celsius up to 80 and 90 degrees Celsius, which in Fahrenheit is around 156 to 200 degrees in Fahrenheit. I personally go to the sauna around four times per week for 15 to 20 minutes at a temperature of 70 to 80 degrees. If you know the, the biochemistry of youth and you're able to 
continuously titrate and keep that youthful indefinitely. You should be able to flatline or slow that age-related decline. So I've been doing that since 2015. Uh, if anyone wants to check it out, uh, I've got videos detailing all of this progress on my YouTube channel, Conquer Aging or Die Trying. So here's the framework of my longevity routine through the longevity leap philosophy. My main goal at my age is to maintain peak physical health, peak physical fitness, peak cognitive function, and peak body composition for as long as possible, while keeping my biomarkers in the optimal range for as long as possible. That's how you slow down aging and add healthy years to your life. But my routine could change when I'm in my 40s, 50s, 60s, or 80s, but the main principles are still the same. You need to follow a healthy lifestyle that includes physical exercise, that includes a healthy diet, adequate sleep, and maintaining optimal body composition. I highly encourage you to check out the blog post where I list out all the references in the description box below. The Longevity Leap is going to be the title of my upcoming book. It covers all the information I talked about here and a lot more. You can sign up for the updates about the book at thelongevityleap.com. Everyone who signs up will also get a bonus chapter about my personal supplementation and my daily routine. And lastly, if you want to see the full version of this video with more details and segments, then make sure you click like, subscribe, and share this video with a friend to inspire their longevity journey. But other than that, thanks for watching this video. My name is Seem. Stay optimized, stay empowered.